Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Barkin, and I want to welcome all of you to the William W. Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar here at the University of Illinois. Can you not hear? That's wrong. Can you hear me now? Ah. I got to <laughs> shove it into my mouth. <laughs> uh, so first of all, if you have a cell phone, please uh, turn it off or put it on vibrate. Uh, if we have a fire alarm, please exit from these doors, uh, go down the stairs in an orderly manner to the first floor, and exit to um, the north across uh, Main Street, and we'll gather outside the Hydro Systems Laboratory, and I'll ask everybody to use the buddy system to make sure that the persons next to you get out. Um, I don't think we're expecting any severe weather, but if we were, we would, instead of going outside, we would go down the hallway this way, back into the old part of Newmark Lab, and then descend all the way down to the basement. Um, if you haven't already swiped or signed into the attendance list, we'll be passing that around, and please do so. Um, and if you did not receive a direct email announcement of this seminar, but you would like to be added to the list to receive those, then please legibly include your email address on that list, and we'll update the list. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome uh, the organizations that are joining us for this seminar. We have representatives from Patrick Engineering and uh, TUV Rail Sciences and Union Pacific Railroad. Um, I'm going to stop doing that. And a reminder to those of you dialing in, if you wish to receive CEUs for your participation, please send L.B. Fry an email with your information as described in the email announcement for the seminar. I'd also like to ask the speaker today to please repeat questions from the audience so that people who are dialing in can hear. And um, also, uh, is Matt here? Matt Green? Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is And I think we will have, I think our speaker will be able to join us before he catches his train home. So if you want to continue the discussion, we can do so there. So the William W. Hay Railroad Seminar Series is sponsored by the National University Rail Center here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And on behalf of all of us here at the university, we thank the USDOT for their ongoing support. It is greatly appreciated by those of us here on campus, as well as all of you who are participating via the Internet. Uh, a number of states and regions in the U.S. are actively pursuing development of improved performance passenger rail systems. Most of these systems will operate primarily or entirely on trackage owned by freight railroads. However, capacity constraints on many of these lines limit the frequency of passenger service that's feasible without additional capacity. Addressing the effect of increase, infrequent schedules and delay on passenger convenience while properly accounting for the cost of freight railroads for passenger operations is a non-trivial problem. And that's exactly the problem that our speaker today is addressing. His research and analytical modeling um, considers the effect of limited passenger schedules while generating strategic level train timetables and quantification of the effect on freight operations. Our speaker, uh, Dr. Bo Tsao, uh, is an assistant professor in transportation systems in the Department of Civil and Materials Engineering and is also an affiliated faculty member of the Urban Transportation Center, both of these at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Dr. Tsao's research interests are in intercity transportation systems, modeling and analysis, in particular for rail and aviation, transportation economics, planning and policy and infrastructure management. Prior to joining uh, the University of Illinois at Chicago, Dr. Tsao was a doctoral student in the National Center of Excellence for Aviation Operations Research at the University of California at Berkeley, where he conducted several research projects on aviation system modeling. Dr. Tso uh, completed his PhD in transportation engineering at the University of California at Berkeley um, and also received a diplôme d'engin. I'm not going to be able to say this right. I need Sam Chadwick. Where is she? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> okay. Uh, a diplôme d'ingénieur from the École Centrale de Nantes, an MS in transportation planning and management, and a BS in civil engineering uh, from uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing. 
Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Dr. Bo Tso, who will present the William Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar on Integrated Modeling of High Performance Passenger and Freight Train Operations on Planning on Shared Use Rail Corridors. Introduction. So, uh, uh, yeah, this is my f second or third time coming to uh, Urbana, but it's first time taking the train. So it's an interesting uh, experience for me this morning. Uh, the train stopped on the way uh, multiple times, and every time it stopped, and the conductor always says, uh, I'm sorry, we apologize, but we are at mercy of the freight railroads. Despite that, we have the scheduling priority. But this is not, uh, the reality is not that uh, Amtrak trains have the scheduling priority. It's a freight, uh, freight railroads, the freight trains have the scheduling priority. But as uh, Chris mentioned, nowadays the passenger transportation is really surging, and we have uh, you know, increasing ridership year by year, and lots of uh, multiple states started building higher, higher performance uh, passenger rail systems, uh, as you may know, in uh, in our states, uh, c between Chicago and St. Louis, uh, there is a 110 mile per hour higher speed train uh, system which is under construction and is supposed to be completed uh, in 2000, uh, 2017. By the time the travel time between St. Louis and Chicago will be reduced by one hour. But again, this is a higher performance system. It's on the shared track. It's a shared use passenger and freight corridor. In other words, the passenger trains will still operate uh, on the same track with freight trains. So there is uh, these uh, mixed operation issues. And how the both sides can deal with uh, mixed operation issues, especially given that the passenger trains uh, are given the scheduling priority. And we want to know what is the impact of having this higher speed passenger service and what is, uh, what is the increase in the operating speed, its effect on the freight operations. And this is what I uh, want to share with you some of uh, my results or research results uh, today. So um, this research is, uh, um, um, is done uh, in collaboration with my PhD student, Ahmad Reza Talibian, um, at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And we, uh, it's uh, in part supported by Illinois Department of uh, Transportation through uh, the Urban Transportation, Urban Transportation Center at UIC. So we are uh, gratefully acknowledge their financial support. Um, I will first uh, give you a brief uh, introduction of the backgrounds and uh, uh, briefly uh, also talk about the literature review, what's already been done in, uh, in existing studies. And then uh, one of the major uh, major uh, uh, new feature in this study is the use of hypergraphs in our modeling of the train operation and uh, creating train, train timetables. Then I'll talk about the formulation of the model that we use to look at the train schedules on both passenger and freight sides. This includes the, the uh, modeling approach, the uh, passenger train side uh, scheduling, and the freight train side scheduling. Then I'll briefly uh, talk about how we solve this formulated model um, and present some numeric analysis results and their implications for policy and planning. Uh, in the end, I'll summarize. As I said, the passenger uh, rail is really uh, experiencing a resurgence in the U.S. over the past uh, decade. And this graph shows uh, national ridership uh, from 2000 to uh, last year, we can see compared to 2000, the ridership has increased by more than 50%. And this trend is still uh, is continuing. So you can see the passenger, uh, uh, the rail is really getting its uh, momentum in the intercity uh, passenger transport. This graph shows uh, the vision by the U.S. DOT of the high-speed uh, rail system in America. And this uh, red line shows the planned um, high-speed rail lines in the country. And those gray lines shows uh, uh, the other intercity rail lines. And we can see there is a, uh, in these different regions, we have uh, Chicago really has a network of uh, high-speed rail uh, system, although this is a vision, it shows that the 
um, the, the country really expects, anticipates that in the future there is going to be demand to, uh, uh, to make the high-speed rail uh, system really feasible and an attractive option to passengers. We also know that uh, in other parts of the country, such as uh, uh, California, uh, the new dedicated uh, track high-speed rail system is being, uh, being developed. Uh, they have higher speed, 220 miles per hour, but it's also more expensive. Uh, it uses uh, brand new tracks. But in the Midwest, uh, we, uh, we use a more a progressive approach uh, in the sense that uh, the high-speed rail or the higher-speed rail system We'll use existing track lines, and we upgrade them in order to accommodate trains that will operate at higher speeds. Uh, for the near term, these uh, passenger trains, after the upgrade is done, will be able to run at a maximum speed of 110 miles per hour. And this graph shows uh, the, also its evasion by the Midwest uh, High Speed Rail Association on um, the future uh, passenger rail system in the Midwest region includes uh, different tiers of systems. The core express running at 125 miles per hour, express uh, running at 90 to 125 miles per hour, and also there's Amtrak conventional rail and existing Amtrak services. Um, particularly for the high uh, for the high speed rail system between Chicago and St. Louis, this is really what's happening now. Uh, the feature of this system is that it will be uh, running the passenger service will be running on a single track system, although with sidings along the line. Uh, there will be shared pass will be shared use corridor uh, shared by passenger and freight trains. The high speed uh, passenger trains will operate at uh, 110 miles per hour. Because of its shared use feature, and there is the issue of mixed operations, how can we uh, plan the, these mixed uh, feature operations? And what is the impact of one side on the other, especially given that, in theory, passenger trains are given the scheduling priority? We know that. Uh, Given the interaction of different types of trains, then there is uh, a compromise, or there is a likelihood of compromise in the on-time performance, operational performance of trains. Uh, this graph is not uh, uh, shows some um, on-time performance experiences on the Northeast Corridor for three types of operations: the Northeast Corridor trains and the non-Northeast Corridor train short distance. Uh, passenger services and non -east, east northeast corridor long distance passenger uh, passenger train services. So we can see that uh, the, the on time performance is really uh, not so satisfactory, especially for the non NEC long distance passenger services. And this implies that if there is a mixed operation, it is important to understand what is interaction and how. Given the understanding, we can help uh, mitigate, or we can help improve the performance, the operation. Yes? But both of these data are, here, I'll use the mic again. Uh, but these are, it's almost strictly a passenger train right, operation. Yeah. So uh, it's a different, I guess, problem in the yeah. sense that it's not the freights that are causing these delays. Yeah, I was trying to grab a really grab a, another graph, but I think this is just to show, given different types of train services, there is mixed operation issue, and certainly this is not exactly what uh, related to what I'm going to talk about, which is about the interaction between freight and passenger services. So there's now tr uh, trivial delays of <laughs> passenger and freight trains. Uh, interaction between these two types of operations is important. Uh, especially for the planning perspective, uh, it is important to understand uh, uh, at a strategic level the, um, the mixed operations on a single track, as is in uh, Chicago to St. Louis uh, uh, high-speed rail line, and shared use passenger and the freight operations on the corridor. And this is uh, the purpose of this study is to develop such a strategic level planning model for the train operations. 
I'll just briefly go through the literature. Um, if you have the paper, there is a more detailed um, discussion on the literature. Uh, there are basically three approaches in train planning analytical models, which uh, appeared in the very early days of, uh, in the field. And then there is a simulation softwares, uh, which were uh, used uh, to simulate the train operation, and the optimization approach. So here, there's a, a, a table shows uh, some of the recent research on uh, using optimization to uh, create train timetables. And you can see, I just want to focus on one column, which is uh, to show what, what kind of uh, approach they use to model the uh, timetabling problem. So uh, almost uh, invariably, all the research except one use a discrete time modeling. And uh, most studies use assume that these uh, passenger train services have an ideal timetable. And this is what we were really concerned about when we started this, uh, this research. Because we, uh, we uh, ask ourselves, what is the ideal timetable for passenger trains? It is not clear to us. There's very limited effort uh, in obtaining an ideal train timetable or schedules. And the travel schedule convenience, which is very important for those uh, for uh, uh, rail service, uh, especially given that the distance is long and the train frequency is relatively low. There is a measure of inconvenience of schedule to passengers, which is uh, called the passenger schedule delay. And this passenger schedule delay component uh, has not been considered uh, in the rail scheduling literature. And we think it's worth to explore uh, how this would impact the scheduling decision. But first, we need to know uh, what is a schedule delay. So here, I want to give you uh, just a brief introduction. Uh, simply speaking, schedule delay for passenger is the difference between one's preferred departure time. So one always has a preferred departure time from his origin. And there is a train timetable. He wants to compare his, schedule, uh, his preferred departure time to the closest train departure. If the train departure is earlier, the closest train departure is earlier, then he would uh, change, adjust his travel plan to take the earlier train. If he's, uh, the closest train departure is later, then he will take a later train. Here is a graph which shows this idea. So we have this graph on the x-axis is the time over the course of the day, and the y-axis shows the number of passengers. So it gives a distribution of the preferred departure time of passengers for an OD pair, for example. So we look at this highlighted bar, which shows uh, there is uh, about, this is certainly a hypothetical number, 12 passengers who prefer to depart at 9 a.m., then those passengers will look at the timetable of passenger trains and to see which train will depart closest to my preferred departure time. Then um, they found that the closest the train departure will be around the 7.30. So they will adjust their trip plan to take this, uh, uh, this uh, 7.30 train. And the difference is about one hour and a half. And that is the schedule delay for passengers. As I said, schedule delay is absent in passenger rail uh, schedule planning. And uh, um, in the literature, binary integer program is a prevailing choice for modeling. It is commonly used, uh, uh, used these uh, segment occupancy models. Sometimes it's also termed, termed block occupancy models. But uh, there is a drawback, which I'll show you in a little bit, that they are less capable of capturing the train transition potential conflict mm -hmm. of trains during transition between segments. There is an emerging method called the hypergraph. Uh, using hypergraph, these uh, transition uh, conflicts, uh, uh, conf train conflicts during transitions can be more adequately captured. And that's why we uh, use hypergraph to model the train uh, operation and create a timetable. So here is uh, a brief introduction of the hypergraphs. 
First, let's look at the traditional uh, approach, the block occupancy models, and to see why this is uh, insufficient to capture the train uh, past conflicts. So there is a time-space um, diagram. So x-axis is time, and y-axis is uh, segments. There are two trains uh, denoted by different colors. The black color goes uh, northbound, and this uh, gray color one goes southbound. So we assume that uh, each block or each segment has a capacity of one train. Then we can see uh, at each block, at any time, there is only one uh, trajectory occupying that. Then the uh, capacity constraint on the block will be satisfied. There is no problem. But using this block occupancy model, it is not able to capture when the two trains both transitioning transition from one block to another and there is a transition point where uh, there is also still the same capacity as the neighboring blocks but this transition <coughs> point would have to accommodate two trains simultaneously and then there is a violation of the cap of the capacity constraint and this capacity constraint violation will not be captured by the traditional block occupancy models. So as I said, there is a transition at the end of the T plus 1 period on the boundary of sec uh, segment 3 and segment 4 will be violated. To address this uh, uh, deficiency of the traditional block occupancy uh, model, uh, we use a hypergraph for train uh, schedule modeling. So uh, we need to introduce a few concepts to describe what is hypergraph. So uh, here we have uh, traditional blocks. So each, uh, each black node denotes uh, the block node. And there is also the hollow nodes, or the, the, the white ones. And they are the transition nodes. As we just saw, there is a potential conflict of trains when they are in transition. So it is important to account for these transition nodes. These black ones are called segment occupancy nodes. Here is just a hypothetical uh, train path. So it goes from segment 1 at time t uh, to segment 2 at time t plus 1 and stay there for two time periods and then goes to uh, segment 3. So this path will consist of uh, multiple hypergraphs and this one, the circle one, would be one of such hypergraphs. And in this hypergraph, um, as it, so each train movement is represented by hypergraph and this hypergraph uh, consists of three nodes, two occupancy nodes and one transition node. By explicitly capturing or uh, uh, recording these nodes, then we can, uh, we can explicitly account for the capacity constraints at the segments as well as at the transition nodes. So a chain of these consecutive hyper arcs would form a train path. This is one hyper arc, and this could be another hyper arc. This is another one, and this is a fourth one. So they together would form a train path. We also use the concept of subtrains uh, because trains, a passenger train, could stop at multiple stations on the way. So we decompose a train starting from its true origin to its true destination into a set of subtrains, and each subtrain would just connect two neighboring stations. And this is uh, just for modeling purpose. Uh, for example, here we have three physical trains, and each physical train goes from station one to station four. Along the way, this uh, physical train will be decomposed into three subtrains. There is linkage between subtrains, and this linkage happens at each individual station. So here is a more, uh, uh, more realistic example. We still use the same, uh, same base. Uh, we have uh, first, uh, 
first subtrain starting from segment one at t at t, and it goes to segment three at t plus two, and then stops there. And there is a uh, this one from t to t plus one. This is the first hyper arc for train for this train, and then from t plus one to t plus two. This is a second hyper arc for the same subtrain. And then when this subtrain arrives at station two, this subtrain would uh, sink to the station. So there's a sink arc for the subtrain. And then this physical train will leave station two for station for the next station. So there has to be a linkage between this uh, subtrain and the next subtrain, both of which represent, rep represent the same physical train. And so there is a link, uh, linking arc. And then the same thing we have to describe, we have to formulate other uh, hyper arcs to represent the movements of the next subtrain along the way. Yes? The linking arc actually would just be called the station dwell time, right? The, the like two minutes stop or three minutes stop? So your question is uh, the linking arc would uh, be used to represent the uh, dwell time at stations. Yes, yes, certainly those uh, linking arcs uh, would capture the dwell time, okay. stopping time. All right, so this is, uh, we have here, we have two trains, R and R, uh, two subtrains, R and R hat. And this is the first hyper arc. This is a sinking arc to the station, to the destination station for the first subtrain. And there's a linkage between the first and the second subtrain. Given this concept, hyper arcs, um, now we can define the decision variables for the model. So the model is to come up with uh, the train, the train timetables. But we have to uh, use some variables to denote how we uh, characterize the train movement. Uh, we have two sets of decision variables. The first one is uh, x, which basically denotes the train. Uh, occupancy, so X has, uh, has four subscripts. Um, the first two denotes the blocks, uh, the segments, and the last two denote the time. For example, here, uh, XIJUV, it means, uh, and it has a superscript R, it means subtrain R would occupy segment I in the interval from U to V and moves to the segment J at time V. So if this is true, then this uh, decision variable takes value one. Otherwise, it takes zero. We have the linkage between subtrains. So we also have to uh, have a variable that captures this linkage. This is what the second uh, set of decision variables uh, do. So uh, we have... Uh, Y, um, another Y, uh, it has uh, two subscripts and two superscripts. So here, if subtrain R arrives at the artificial sync node ER at time T, and this continuation subtrain R hat resumes the journey from the origin node uh, OW hat, which is also at the same, this, at the same station at uh, time T hat, then this uh, Linkage decision variable will take value one and zero otherwise. With these decision variables, uh, we approach the train scheduling problem from a central planner's perspective. Just recall that we have two types of trains. We have passenger trains and freight trains. The premise of this approach is that uh, we, we know by public law, uh, the Amtrak trains have scheduling priority over all freight trains, although whether this is true in reality is, uh, is a topic to uh, discuss or to debate. So uh, following that, we adopt a two-level modeling approach, a sequential approach. At the top level, we first model the passenger train scheduling problem. Then given the passenger train scheduling schedules, we insert freight trains into the line such that the freight train cost is uh, minimized. 
On the passenger side, uh, there are different types of costs. There is uh, train operating costs, of course. There is passenger in-vehicle travel cost, travel time cost. There is passenger schedule delay cost. Uh, I, uh, we just saw what is schedule delay in the beginning. So uh, at the top level, we intend to design a schedule which permits two opposing trains, passenger trains, to pass without uh, uh, stopping, and this is called a flying meet. And this is also what we want to uh, we want to maintain because this is a strategic level planning. So uh, I think this is a reasonable assumption because we don't have uh, we don't have uh, train stops in the middle. Then the optimization of the train schedule would just uh, reduce to the minimization of the passenger schedule delay because the other two components would simply be constant. And this passenger schedule delay would be a function of the passenger demand profile. Uh, we just saw the distribution of passengers' preferred departure time over the course of a day. So for each OD pair, we assume that uh, there is a passenger profile, uh, which is called the preferred departure time of passengers. And passengers are served by a predetermined number of trains, passenger trains. So again, we use this uh, graph. We have uh, here, we have three, uh, train, three uh, passenger trains in uh, from OD pair. Then uh, there is a distribution of passengers' preferred departure time. For each passenger, as we just described, he will uh, self-select the, the desired train according to his preferred departure time and the departure timetable of the trains. By, doing, uh, uh, by using this self-selection process, then the passengers can be, uh, can be divided into groups, each of which would uh, board a particular passenger train. And, and we measure the distance between each passenger's preferred departure time and the trains, and his chosen train's departure time, that gives the schedule delay. And the passenger side problem is to minimize the sum of the schedule delay across all the passengers. So uh, the object function uh, basically is, um, is what I said, minimizing the schedule delay of passengers. Uh, but there's some um, modeling details. Uh, first, we look at the first, first train or first subtrain because subtrain correspond, each subtrain corresponds to a station. Uh, scheduled delay for passengers who take the first train. Then there is also scheduled delay for passengers take an uh, intermediate subtrain traveling for each uh, for each uh, station pair. And there is uh, scheduled delay for passengers who take the last train. And the last one is a penalty uh, for staying longer than the scheduled dwelling time at the station. Uh, so there are different terms. Uh, for example, for the passengers who take the first train, there is passengers whose preferred departure times are on the left-hand side or earlier than the first train. That will be captured, their schedule data will be captured by this term, by the first term. And there are also passengers whose preferred departure times are later than their chosen train's departure. The schedule delay will be captured by the second term. The next slide will show uh, how the schedule delay is calculated. Uh, so we just take uh, take this part, look at the passenger schedule delay for passengers whose preferred departure time is earlier than the departure of the first train. Have a question? Yeah. So. <clears throat> Do you, are you basically equating um, the passengers that need to wait for a train because the scheduled delay time is, scheduled departure time is later than their preferred, are you treating that difference the same as the ones who have to leave earlier than they would prefer, which isn't delay per se, but it's, it's, and if you're going to get to this, you know, just say that. So, in other words, are you treating those two different time metrics of inconvenience to the passenger the same way? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, if you look at 
if I understand correctly, you are saying the passengers whose preferred departure time is earlier than the train's departure versus later than the train's departure, then the inconvenience will be different. I'm, I'm, I'm asking the question. I don't have any presupp pre presupposition. I'm just Certainly, like, yeah, there could be a uh, difference in terms of the value of that schedule inconvenience. And this is captured by these two coefficients. So this is a schedule delay for passengers who prefer depart earlier than the schedule, uh, than the than train departure. So they have a different value of the schedule inconvenience uh, than passengers whose departure time, preferred departure time is later. I, I, I mean, for the first term, basically those people are taking they're getting there later than they would like to get there. So yes. It's, so it's delay in the it's delay. Kind of classic yeah. sense. In the other case, essentially the trip has to start sooner than they would prefer. Right. So which they have to move on. Strictly isn't delay, but it's 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 inconvenience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so. I, well, I wonder could that be determined by the arrival station then maybe of the arriving. Well, I'm just asking how you're handling it mathematically. If you're making a distinction, it sounds uh -huh. like. You, you're not, right? Uh, I'm making a distinction here by using different coefficients. Y yes. Uh -huh. All right. Well, go yeah. ahead. But yes, yeah, schedule delay is a term that is used for schedule transportation systems in transit, in air transportation. So uh, per se, it's not a delay. It's about schedule inconvenience. All right. I think I need to uh, speed up a little bit. So basically, you look at, uh, for the first train, passengers on the earlier than the first train departure, then what you look at is you look at each fraction, each segment of passengers for a given time block, and you measure the distance for every uh, time block, and you multiply, you sum up all these time differences weighted by the passenger number of passengers departing, prefer to depart at each time block. And then you come up with uh, the schedule delay of those passengers uh, who prefer to depart earlier than the first train departure. In the same way, you calculate the passengers whose preferred departure time is, earlier, is later than the first train's departure, but they prefer to choose the first train. And then you sum up these two parts, would give you the passenger schedule delay for those passengers who take the first train. And this one, because we don't know where the passenger, the, when the first passenger train departs, so we have to sum up over all the passenger, all the possibilities of the first passenger train departure. Um, on the passenger side, there's also issue of maintaining the order among subtrains to ensure that uh, uh, to ensure that the order is is uh, is really maintained among these physical trains. We don't allow one passenger train to overpass to surpass uh, an earlier passenger train en route. There is uh, we so we penalize the combination of the starting arcs of uh, starting arcs of two consecutive subtrains which violate the order of subtrains by large number m. So this is called big M method, and this is uh, and we introduce that term in the uh, objective function. But certainly this scheduling problem is uh, subject to a set of constraints. Uh, lots of them are very common in uh, train scheduling literature, such as there's a unique departure at the origin a unique syncing at the destination, flow conservation, linkage between trains. We have different subtrains. There's a linkage, binary variables. There's a capacity constraint at segments. And there also there's capacity constraint when trains are transitioning. There's a headway, man headway constraint as well. So for the time being, um, I'm not going to the details of this, uh, but you can certainly find out the more, uh, more detailed description in the paper. All right. Um, we have talked about the passenger side. Now let's uh, move on to the free side. What is, uh, what's the problem on the free side? It is basically given the passenger train schedules. Now we want to insert free trains such that the free side cost is minimized. A free side is dispatched whenever the passenger, uh, the, the train receives in enough load. And that's uh, the practice in the North American context. The freight train schedule is less precise and uh, less precise and stringent. We consider three components on the free side cost. There is a foregone demand cost. If there's capacity constraints, 
because of the passenger presence of passenger trains, then some freight trains will not be able to operate, and then there is a loss of revenue. We also consider the departure delay of freight trains. There is uh, also on route delay of, uh, of these trains in order to have the opposing trains to, uh, uh, to meet and surpass, uh, to meet and also to allow faster passenger trains to surpass if necessary. The uh, optimization problem on the free side is to minimize the sum of the three components, the foregone demand cost, the, schedule de uh, the departure delay cost, and the on route delay cost. Uh, so uh, here is the objective function. Uh, we have this departure delay, the foregone demand, and the on route delay. Um, now we have to solve this problem. On the free side, the constraint will be very similar to, on the, uh, similar to the passenger side constraints, so I didn't show it here. Uh, for solving this problem, uh, on the top level, for the passenger side problem, it is a quadratic integer programming uh, because uh, intuitively, if you consider a passenger's decision on which train to take, will depend on two neighboring trains, two neighboring trains, its relative position to the departure times of the two neighboring trains. So, uh, because of that, then it becomes a quadratic problem, and we are integer. Our uh, decision variables are integers, so it's a quadratic integer programming problem. And this is a simple form of this problem. Uh, it's in general MP hard, and uh, solving this uh, large problem without any modification will, uh, uh, will be very computationally challenging. So we try to find some remedies. Uh, here's uh, the strategies that we ended up choosing. So first, uh, we try to uh, drop this big M term. Um, because uh, it uh, it's, uh, involves a big M, and this M is much larger than the values in other terms. Then we also uh, linearize the quadratic objective function. And then we're further simplifying the problem by taking some special structure, taking advantage of some special structure of the simplified problem. Okay, yeah. Um, so first is dropping the, the big M term. And this uh, big M term, as I said, will create large differences in values of the different terms in the object function. And this could lead to a large round of errors. Um, so we replace the big M term by this additional, this new constraint, which basically says that the starting arc of the, of, uh, the later train plus all possible starting arcs of the immediate previous train must be equal to a less than one. So this basically says a later train, a later train would not be allowed to, uh, to surpass the earlier train. So this avoids, by doing so, uh, we can avoid the round of errors and introduce new cuts, which also helps improve the computational efficiency. Then the second step is to linearize the quadratic object function. So we introduce a set of uh, new variables z, and each z would be a product of two uh, x. So x is, uh, each x is a binary variable indicating the movement of a train. And because uh, we, uh, we introduce z, and this, uh, this uh, interaction between two subtrains will not be captured if we just introduce z, but we have to use z to capture the interaction between two subtrains. And this is done by uh, further introducing three sets of constraints. Uh, what it says essentially is that z is uh, less than, um, the value of z is less than either of the x variables it, it is associated. In addition, z is equal to 1 only when both x values are equal to 1 as obvious uh, from the definition here. But the last one, the last constraint, uh, uh, would introduce a large number of constraints, uh, would involve a large number of uh, constraints, because each combination of two x would present, present, would present a constraint. So there's lots of inequality constraints like this. And we realize that this can actually be simplified 
Because each subtrain has a unique departure, therefore there is only one combination of starting arcs of two consecutive trains that can be equal to one. Mathematically, so we sum up all the possible Zs uh, for two um, all the, uh, for two subtrains, then the summation should be equal to one, and they substantially reduce the number of constraints. We use this to replace the last constraints here. So uh, this new constraint represents the same characteristics, but with much fewer constraints. And by doing this, uh, the problem can be solved much faster in the in the uh, order of several minutes for the passenger side problem. And for the free side problem, it is a linear integer program because it does not involve any schedule delay. So it also can be solved uh, fairly quickly in the order of uh, minutes. So now I want to show you some numeric analysis results. Uh, first, I want to introduce, uh, present a small problem, small size problem. And then I want to particularly uh, discuss on the impact of speed heterogeneity on the train, on the system performance. And then a larger problem, which is uh, to uh, uh, simulate the Chicago to St. Louis high speed rail corridor. The smaller problem set up has uh, 11 segments, uh, five, six track segments, and five sidings. Only consider two ODs, uh, one station at each end. And each track segment is uh, 80 miles long. Each siding is two miles long. And the uh, total corridor length is uh, 120 miles. Uh, we consider free train operates at 60 miles per hour, passenger trains at uh, 120 miles per hour. Consider daily service frequency uh, of one to six trains in each direction. And because passenger trains, depending on how frequent the services, then there could also be change in passenger demand. So we consider demand to be elastic with the elasticity of 0.4. So the, the first two graphs shows the, how the total passenger schedule delay cost and the schedule delay cost per passenger will change as a function of number of passenger trains scheduled in each direction. We can see that if we add one train to an existing train on the line, then there will be a very substantial drop in the passenger schedule delay. Whereas if we already have very frequent, a fairly frequent service, say five trains per day in each direction, then adding one more train would have a, uh, a less significant change in passenger schedule delay. So it diminishes, the effect of schedule delay reduction diminishes as we add more and more trains. On the free side, uh, as uh, we have three components, we decompose the total cost into these three components. Uh, the red one shows the late departure cost, departure delay cost. Uh, the green is the foregone demand cost, and the black is uh, the, the green is en route delay cost, and the black is uh, foregone demand cost. What we can see is that the total cost on the free side certainly increases as we schedule more passenger trains. The departure delay cost is relatively stable uh, across all six scenarios. The red bars are relatively uh, are similar. Then en route delay cost has uh, increased as we schedule more trains. Uh, more importantly, the foregone demand becomes most important cost component when more than three passenger trains are scheduled. We schedule more trains than fewer freight trains can be scheduled on the corridor. And this foregone demand would result in lots of uh, revenue loss. This graph shows a marginal change on both passenger and free side. The, uh, the blue line shows a marginal uh, passenger schedule delay cost change. The red line shows the marginal free cost change. And this uh, green line shows the marginal total cost change. What we can observe is that net marginal benefit gain only occurs, only occurs when the number of passenger trains increase from one to two. And there's also some slight positive uh, car total cost change when we increase uh, the number of passenger trains from four to five. But in other cases, 
then the marginal cost increase on the free side will be larger than the marginal schedule delay reduction on the passenger side. Then uh, we also look at the impact of speed heterogeneity on the system performance. Uh, what we uh, did is we assume constant passenger train speed, but we vary the free train speed uh, uh, by a wide range from 12 miles per hour to 120 miles per hour. Uh, what we found is that, um, so here, this is a graph shows the total freight side cost as a function of number of passenger trains scheduled on the line. And each line here represents uh, one freight train speed. So we can see that if there is a great, uh, greater speed difference between passenger, passenger and freight trains, then there will be a higher free side cost. The sensitivity of free side cost to the number of passenger trains vary. It, it is not necessarily uh, monotonic. We can see those curves or those lines which have the steeper, which have the which have steeper slopes. Uh, those uh, with uh, speeds not the slowest, nor the fastest, uh, nor the fastest, but just someone in the middle, 40 miles per hour, or uh, 24 miles per hour, the free side cost is most sensitive to the number of passenger trains scheduled. How about number of freight trains? So here is another graph shows the number of um, freight trains that can be scheduled as a function of number of passenger trains on the line. Different colors represent different freight train speeds. The number of freight trains shows a non-increasing non trend with a uh, number of passenger trains scheduled uh, for each speed choice. In the extreme case, when freight trains are really, really slow, then the freight service will disappear entirely from the line uh, if four or more passenger trains are scheduled. So speed uh, heterogeneity uh, is really compromising the performance or the ability of the freight railroad to schedule their services. In terms of en route delay cost uh, for the freight trains, so we observe a similar pattern. If there is no, no difference in terms of speeds between passenger and freight trains, then there is no uh, en route delay cost for freight trains. But if there is a bigger speed difference between the two types of services, then en route delay cost will be much larger. Finally, uh, let's look at a larger problem. Uh, it's uh, set up with Chicago to St. Louis uh, higher speed rail corridor. It's uh, 285 miles long. It's a shared use passenger and freight corridor, which has 17 double track and uh, 14 single track segments. Passenger train speed is assumed to be uh, 90 miles per hour, accounting for acceleration and deceleration effects. And freight train speed is uh, assumed 30 miles per hour. And uh, we, consider two end, uh, we consider six stations, two at the ends of the line, and four intermediate stations uh, on this corridor. The OD uh, demand uh, among these stations account for more than 95% of the total traffic along the line, although there are some mi minor stations that uh, also stops for the proposed uh, passenger service. And we consider three scenarios. Uh, 2015 projected passenger demand and current freight demand, uh, five passenger trains each day. And also 2020 projected passenger demand, five trains and projected freight demand and 2020 projected passenger demand with uh, six passenger trains and the projected freight demand. And these numbers are based on uh, Illinois DOT high speed rail study report. Uh, here we have a timetable show which shows uh, the train trajectories for uh, the 2015 demand. And we can, the red line shows the passenger train service. The black line shows the freight train services. So uh, based on the, uh, the IDOTS report, uh, there is uh, almost all the trains, freight trains, run just in between of a fraction uh, of the uh, in just a fraction of the Chicago to St. Louis corridor. 
But what we are more interested in is how this cost to passenger side and the free side would evolve if we have increasing demand in the future. Uh, before going to that, uh, we see we calculated the average passenger schedule delay just under the current demand, which is about uh, 40, 47 dollars for each passenger. Uh, we also checked the IDOT reports, which says the proposed rail ticket price for this corridor is uh, 39 dollars. So basically, what this implies is that the schedule delay cost is comparable to uh, what you actually pay out of your pocket. So it is very important to consider this schedule delay component when, uh, when Amtrak or the passenger train service is scheduling the trains. On the free side, uh, we plot the cost uh, for the current, under current demand as well as when demand has increased uh, with five passenger trains and with one more passenger train scheduled on the line. Again, here, uh, black uh, shows, represents the foregone demand, the red part denotes the departure delay, and the green part denotes the en route delay. With a projected, yes, Chris. Uh, we have a question from one of our online participants. Uh -huh. Can you go back to the uh, string chart? Yeah, that. They're asking why the freight trains don't traverse the entire route. That's based on uh, the freight traffic reported on the IDOT reports. Okay. So that's, uh, yeah, certainly it could be, but we just don't know what it, it, it will look like. So we use uh, what the IDOT reported in terms of the traffic. So on slide 47. Now, uh, we have these three components, cost components, the foregone demand cost, the departure delay cost, and the en route delay cost. So uh, when the projected freight demand is in place, the freight railroad, as we can see, will really experience a significant cost increase. And what this implies is that there is a really strong uh, presence of capacity constraints on the line, given passenger and freight demand growth in the future, and this uh, may uh, imply the needs for capacity investment on the line, for example, by adding more sidings or perhaps adding a second track. So uh, in summary, uh, this research uh, presents a two-level modeling framework for shared rail uh, corridor planning. Uh, we consider, we give a, a more comprehensive consideration of different costs and time components while modeling the train timetables. Uh, this includes passenger schedule delay, which had not been considered in the existing literature, as well as the elasticity of demand. We employ a hypergraph-based modeling approach, which is more capable of capturing the potential transition constraints transition constraint, or potential train pass conflicts during transition. Uh, we design an efficient solution approach to solve the planning problem with uh, short computation time. Some policy implications. Uh, first, schedule delay is very important in passenger generalized travel costs and therefore very important when we do passenger service planning, train rail service planning. We also found that marginal schedule delay cost reduction is diminishing when we have more and more passenger trains scheduled. So there must be some point where we should stop at scheduling a number of passenger trains because scheduling more would generate less benefits than the cost imposed down to the free side. Some free trains will be uh, forced out of service and foregone demand costs will substantially increase as more passenger services are scheduled. Marginal freight cost increase in most cases higher than the marginal passenger schedule delay reduction so this uh, is very important issue because this is oftentimes the arguments of why we free railroads should give priority to passenger trains. And uh, there is also the negotiation between passenger and free side. There is capacity. What's the price of using the capacity of the host of freight railroads? And this research could provide some insights about the costs and benefits of providing passenger train 
services on freight host rail, railroads. The heterogeneity of train speed significantly affects the free side cost. So from our analysis, it may be that we should increase the freight train speed when high speed rail or higher speed rail is introduced on shared use corridors in order to uh, have, in order to reduce the free side cost and optimize the operation performance. So we also have some ongoing research. Uh, first is to extend the hypergraph-based modeling to uh, consider more comprehensively the rail uh, operation practice, such as by allowing the en route stopping of passenger trains. And second is we want to incorporate uh, the development schedule models into capacity allocation schemes. The capacity allocation in the rail industry is more a negotiation process. So we want to capture the behavior, some gaming behavior of different uh, players in the negotiation and how the, the equilibrium in the negotiation can be achieved. So with that, I think uh, that's uh, the end of the presentation. Again, I would like to acknowledge the partial support from IDOT through the uh, UTC Center at UIC. And uh, thank you for your attention. Any questions will be welcome. Yeah, Peter. Uh, I have two quick questions. The first one is that I would like to know: Did you consider the fly me possibility in your model? And the second one is: um, Did you t uh, does the model has a capability to consider uh, multiple free schedules? So the first question is, do I consider flight meets? Yeah, in the model you just presented. Right. So I think on one side, I assume that for passenger trains, when they meet, it's a fly, uh, it's a fly meet. So they don't stop when they yeah, meet. Yeah, the reason I ask this question is that I would like to know, did you consider some infrastructure constraints? Because um, that will have some impacts on fly meet. Because uh, for example, if you have different number of turnouts, then you may be able to travel with different maximum speed on the siding. So, which means if you have different maximum speed on the siding for the passenger train, then the, ply, the length of siding required to execute fly me may be different. So, I don't know if you consider this kind of variation in your model. No, this model does not consider this infrastructure, more detailed infrastructure relation with the requirement. So, clarify, so you assume train speed was the same whether it was on the siding or on the main? Right, yeah. I don't distinguish the speed on the siding and on the main. Yeah, I think this is something that may be valuable and can be added into a model because I saw some European high speed rail planning projects they seriously consider this kind of possibility because they are going to construct something like single track lines with uh, partial long sidings for the high speed rail trains to execute fly meet. And they do want to model this kind of variation. So, yeah, okay. this is one thing. Uh, another thing is about the freight schedule. Yeah. So the second question is uh, about uh, the, the, the is it, uh, does your model has the capability to consider multiple? Um, oh, multiple freight, freight train schedule. types. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, it's multiple freight freight train schedule, not multiple uh, freight train type. Yeah. What do you mean multiple train schedule? Okay. Uh, it's more like because, just like we know, um, most of the Freight trains. Um, I would say the freight transport, uh, freight train transportation has more uh, var variety in train delay. So, which means that the train may not depart at the time you said originally planned to depart. Which means, if you want to consider more robust impact from the freight traffic, maybe you need to consider multiple uh, train schedule like. You consider a scenario which train, freight train A depart on time, or another scenario which freight train A departure like temp, uh, an hour after or two hours after, and consider all these kind of impact, uh, all the impact from this kind of variation. Did, you, uh, did I explain my question? Uh, I think so. Your question is about the 
does the model consider the multiple freight train departure delay? Yeah, or we just say the variation of variation the freight train schedule. Yeah. So then I think this question relates to whether a freight railroad would give different priority to different freight trains. Then if a higher priority freight train, then he would uh, allow it to depart earlier as, uh, as much as possible. Whereas for lower lower value free train, then it will be given the lowest priority. I think uh, no. In this model, we don't consider like priorities of or relative importance of different freight trains, but we just say it's a freight railroad. It wants to minimize the overall cost. I guess I have a different variation on the exchange question. Which forgive me if I is this a stochastic or deterministic? Deterministic. Ah, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that also can relate to uh, stochasticity of train. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, see, in in a shared corridor, I'm assuming that the percentage of time the high speed rail uh, occupies the shared corridor would be very less as compared to the freight train. So why is that uh, the high-speed rail is given more priority over the freight train? Shouldn't it be the other way around? <laughs> Some people might think that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, to add to this point, uh, the cost associated with like um, the uh, freight train, the the freight cost. In increase uh, was much higher as compared to the schedule mm -hmm. delay decrease in the passenger train, mm -hmm. right, in the uh, in the shared corridor. So considering these two factors, why do you think uh, it is given more priority, the passenger trains are given more priority? This is my question. Uh, I think the first, the first question is why uh, we give priority to passenger trains. I think we should direct this question to uh, federal government instead of directing it to me. Uh, yeah, that's the policy question. There is, uh, I think, back in the 1980s, there is a passage. It's when Amtrak was formed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when Amtrak was formed, there is a legislation which mandates that freight railroads, when passenger trains, Amtrak trains use the freight railroads, Amtrak trains are supposed to have the scheduling priority. And because we want to have a reliable or on-time performance for the passenger rail service. But although the reality is different, um, second question is: uh, you have uh, schedule delay cost, which is uh, schedule delay cost reduction is lower than the free side cost increase. And your question is: because of this, also shouldn't it be the other way around? This was my question. Oh right. So yeah, certainly that depends. As I showed, I show lots of graphs, but many of them are a function of number of passenger trains scheduled on a line. Depending on how, ma how many trains already, passenger trains already there, the schedule delay reduction will be quite different. The same, in the same manner, the increase in the free side cost could also be quite different. So it's totally dependent on where you are, how many trains are already in service. Where did you get those? From literature, that's very difficult. We spend lots of time. Yeah. But to speak to your question in part, freight trains are much, they earn much more money than passengers. Yeah, yeah. And so there's this, it's, it's almost impossible to make a passenger train equivalent in value to a freight train. To a freight train, train yeah. Without charging so much that nobody would ride it, in which case. Yeah, right, yeah. So, yeah. Because it's a, one is a private industry, one is a public service. That's a good point. All right. Uh. Uh, so my my question is about the schedule delay definition. Yeah. Because it, it considers the departure time, but would it be any different if it instead of considering the departure time, consider the arrival time for the passenger, uh, especially if we think the possibility of uh, in route delay. Um, so, 
in this case, we don't consider because it's a strategic level planning for passenger train service. So there's no en route delay for passenger trains. Then their preferred departure time and preferred arrival time would just be different by a constant. So there is essentially no difference. Certainly, we can model the preferred arrival time instead of preferred departure time. But when at more technical level, if en route delay is considered, then it will be somewhat different we can, when we consider prefer arrival versus prefer departure. Thank you. And it also has to do with the passengers. Um, so I think it's my understanding that you didn't allow the passenger demand to vary depending on how far people had to adjust their schedules. Passenger sense? demand to vary. Well, there is a, you, you remember there is a graph. Right, but that's observed? That's observed. Yeah, that's basically you can gain that from some survey, and you have a distribution of the passenger's preferred departure time. Right. But we also consider, depending on how many trains, passenger trains are scheduled, then the height of that would change. And that's captured by the elasticity okay. of demand. All right, thanks. Okay. Uh, I have a follow-up question yeah, about a passenger. I think yeah, if, if the like a preferable departure time is come from like some survey, maybe if they like in a survey, if like is there any like a spatial constraint of the passenger? It may be like oh, maybe I can only take earlier train or a later train. I think if there are some like special constraint in the survey, and it can it could be also considered in your model. Like I think that the the delay will change because even though like because um, right now in your model you you only like consider like the, the shortest time between the the departure time mm -hmm. and the preferable mm -hmm. departure time. But if like the passenger have a special constraint, yeah, maybe maybe the delay may be longer. For individual passengers, this uh, uh, temporal or spatial constraint certainly could be present. But uh, this is not, I think it's a train schedule, so it's not about individual travelers. It's about uh, aggregate all the travelers' preferences as a whole. So maybe there is some cancellation. Some ones uh, they have constraints, but some ones are more flexible. And, but we don't, uh, I think the focus is not on individual's behavior. Um. I think we have a question from one of our internet. Uh -huh. uh, let me just read it. So the question is, how does the model treat local freight versus through freight? Do you distinguish between? Right. So uh, local freight. So uh, if we have a line, we have multiple stations of a freight. Have uh, some freight trains only run on a segment of this line. Then, uh, based on historic data, we could have his, uh, it's, a, it's a preferred departure time uh, from the origin. And for through freight, again, if we want to really use the model in practice, then we also look at historic data and to come up with some statistics to say what is the normal or most frequent, or it, it could be a distribution of the preferred uh, arriving time at one end of the line. And then it's um, and then maybe it's preferred arrival time at the other end of the line, and then use that, and we can use a model also to um, to uh, uh, come up with the time schedule for freight trains. And certainly, if there is a through uh, through trains, there is also issue of whether it's just uh, trains all from one railroad or from multiple railroads. Then it's a different issue of scheduling. Yes. Um, have you studied or will you study uh, passenger train schedules as far as memory patterns? We look at Metro, that 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, every hour there's a Metro departure. Yeah. But with Amtrak, they rarely do that. Would freight train delays and passenger delays be reduced if there was a memory pattern for Amtrak? Um. That is, uh, we can certainly try. This model certainly is capable of trying. Say, we just, uh, regardless of passengers' preferred departure time, we just schedule hourly services. Right. But or every two hours. Yeah, every two hours, hours, every three hours. 
but Just will that also improve your uh, passenger delay issues as well? Um, I I don't think we improve the passenger delay, passenger schedule delay, okay. because the model specifically wants to minimize passenger schedule delay, whereas if you just uh, schedule uh, equal, equally distant um, passenger train departures, then it's, there's nothing involved in optimization in minimizing passenger schedule delay. So the results certainly would be larger than the schedule delay results here. Hi, Tyler. Hey, Bo. Uh, good to see another presentation on this. As I said, Thank I you. told you before, it's, I think it's innovative to incorporate you know, passenger preference and demand into this sort of model, and I don't think I've seen it done before. Uh, but similar on the freight side, you've got a freight train departure delay cost. So how did you determine your initial distribution of freight train demand? So Very good question. I've got another question after that one, too. OK. <laughs> so yeah, Tyler's question is about uh, how do I determine the preferred departure time of freight trains? It's a very good question, and uh, we, we were not able to find uh, any uh, related references talking on this issue. So what we assume in this model is we assume that there is a um, uniform distribution of freight trains preferred departure over the course of a day. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the second one, I think maybe this has been slightly asked before, but um, the fact that I think relates to Chris's point earlier that you're treating passengers that are forced to depart later and earlier the same. Obviously, there's going to be a certain subset of passengers that simply can't leave earlier, right? You've got a meeting in Chicago. It ends at 3. You know, you can't take the 2 o'clock train, right? You've got to wait for the next train, obviously. Right. So yeah, I, I agree. Uh, so there's certainly passengers <coughs> who are more flexible and uh, also passengers who are uh, more stringent in their schedule, and uh, the, in the modeling approach, what, how we can capture this, basically we give a much higher penalty for those passengers if they are less flexible. And uh, um, if we really want to look into deeper into that, maybe we can divide passengers into two different groups or multiple groups. You say this group, which has 30% uh, in the total passenger demand, they have much higher value of schedule inconvenience and then that will impose higher penalty. So then the resulting freight train, uh, passenger train schedule would uh, be leaning towards more to the convenience of schedule for those high value passengers. The hypergraph uh, looks very similar to uh, certain visual representations of uh, finite element analysis and numerical methods. Um, are they related? Uh, last time I touched on finite elements was uh, nine years ago. <laughs> so yeah, I, maybe I need to look into the textbook first before I answer your question. All right, well, with that, uh, we'll I want to thank you again for a fantastic seminar. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Hey there, how are you? Good to see you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry I missed the main part. No, no, no. You said you have something. Yeah, but I'm glad you came here. Um, so what is your schedule now? Are you so, uh, yeah, I think this, 